podcast sponsorship by Stanford Healthcare, which now has exceptional Stanford Medicine-affiliated primary care doctors located throughout the greater Bay Area. To find one near you, go to stanfordhealthcare.org slash local doctor. From KQED Public Radio in San Francisco, I'm Dave Iverson, in this week for Michael Krasny. 105 years ago, Governor Hiram Johnson ushered in numerous progressive era reforms, including the ballot initiative, and Californians have been pretty enamored with it ever since. Only these days, the love fest requires some pretty heavy lifting. This November, voters will have to wade through 17 different ballot initiatives, which means that three pound document landing on your doorstep this fall won't be an old fashioned phone book. It'll just be your voter's guide. In our first hour of forum this morning, we'll take up why recent reform efforts have failed to curb our appetite for ballot initiatives and whether so much direct democracy is too much of a good thing. That's next on forum after this. From KQED Public Radio in San Francisco, I'm Dave Iverson, in this week for Michael Krasny. They range across just about every issue imaginable, from cigarette taxes to school funding, from the death penalty to prescription drug costs, pornography to plastic bags, large capacity ammunition magazines to marijuana. They are all subjects of ballot initiatives facing California voters this November. 17 in all, 17 key public policy decisions voters will need to make decisions about on top of just a few other important electoral decisions to consider. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Reforms enacted by the legislature in 2014 were designed to reduce the ballot initiative glut, but it didn't quite work out that way. Why those reforms didn't pan out this year and whether the ballot initiative process still serves a critical role in what makes California tick is our topic in this hour of forum. Joining us to do that, Peter Schrag. He is a journalist and author, former editorial page editor at the Sacramento Bee. Peter's books include California, America's High Stakes Experiment and Paradise Lost, California's Experience, as well as most recently when Europe was a prison camp father and son memoirs. Peter joins us today. Peter, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Happy to have you join us. Yes. Mark Baldessari joins us as well. Mark, of course, is the CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California, an organization that has long studied this particular issue, as has Mark. Mark, pleasure to have you on our program this morning. Thank you. Kim Alexander joins us too from Sacramento. Kim is the president and founder of the California Voter Foundation. Kim, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Dave. And Stephen Greenott joins us, too. Stephen is the Western Region Director for the R Street Institute, a free market think tank. He's also a columnist for the American Spectator and the Orange County Register. Stephen, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So this is a fun, interesting, fascinating, perplexing topic, all of those things uh, combined. Uh, Kim, I know every year uh, you or every other year, at least, you put together a, a ballot song. I'm not going to ask you to re give us your rendition for 2016, uh, but uh, it is, among other things, I know, a song that will be chock full of lyrics because it's a really long ballot. Um, give us sort of a sense of, of why it's so chock full this year, why the ballot this year is composed of some 17 ballot initiatives, the most, I think, in the last 16 years. Yeah, there are a couple of reasons for that. And I actually just finished drafting the song. Uh, it clocked out at four minutes, which is the longest <laughs> one so far. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, there's something for everyone on this ballot. And one of the reasons why we have so many measures is because there was a law passed um, in 2010 that changed it so that only uh, initiatives would only appear on the November ballot. So they would no longer be on the June ballot. It was, you know, the public policy reason for this was that the presumption was fewer people would vote in June than in November, and so we should put the initiatives where the most voters are. But the the political reason was that there were initiatives that were going to be on the ballot in, in the next election that uh, the governor and, and labor groups wanted to see uh, put on the November ballot. So they changed the law, and I, I took a look to see, you know, when the measures, these 17 measures qualified. And if we hadn't changed the law, I estimate about seven of them would have been on the June ballot rather than on this ballot. So that's definitely a big reason why we see so many. And Mark Baldessari, what are the, some of the, the reasons why, in your judgment at least, this becomes a, a challenge for voters? Obviously, the, the number of them is part of the reason, but is it also the complexity of the issues involved? Yes. Um, 
we've been asking um, in our polls about um, how voters feel about the initiative process for many years. And while they like the initiative process, um, they don't think it's a perfect uh, system. Um, the biggest complaints people have are um, the, the number of measures on the ballot, but even more so the complexity, the, how, the complicated nature of the ballot itself and, uh, and their inability to sort of figure out what happens if a certain initiative passes. Eight out of 10 voters in our most recent poll said that the complexity the fact that uh, the, the ballot measures um, are often very complicated makes it hard. And of course, it's, it's even harder if there are a lot of measures on the ballot. And yet we also know, Mark Baldessari, that Californians love this and love this for like 105 years, going back to the progressive era of Hiram Johnson. They love it. And um, voters also think they're pretty good at it compared to the governor and legislature. They feel that they do a better job in making laws and public policy. Um, that's not that's never something that that our legislators like to hear. But in our polls, um, seven and ten say they think the initiative process is a good thing. And six and ten say they think they do a better job, that the voters do a better job than the governor and legislature. And that's a feeling that um, is shared by Democrats, Republicans and independents in our polls. Pick up on that, if you would, Stephen Greenhunt, because you're a defender of the initiative um, uh, process that for for all its complexity, for all of the challenges that voters face, that there you think, I, I believe, that there is still a definite role for this to play in the way in which California is governed. Yeah, absolutely. I have mixed feelings. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, libertarian in my, my viewpoints. Um, so, I, you know, it's I guess neither here nor there. Uh, I'm not trying to judge it, in other words, based on what the, the end result would be. But I, I like the idea that the, the public can weigh in and, uh, and, and you know, self-governing, even though it's a kind of progressive era idea, and I'm certainly not a progressive. Um, it's, it's a useful check on, uh, on a legislature and one that, you know, is dominated by one party. Uh, so it's a good possible uh check on it. So I, I do like it, but I also, uh, I hear what Mark's saying. I mean, it's it's a little scary when I hear from people every election who, smart people, who say, hey, you know, because I write about it, they'll say, hey, what should I vote for on these initiatives? I'm like, I, I don't know what you should vote for, but you start looking into it and you realize that a lot of people uh, don't understand even the uh, basic details of what they're voting on. But then again, the legislature often doesn't know what they're going to be voting on either which is one of the reasons one of the initiatives on the ballot is the 72-hour rule. So, uh, yeah, mixed feelings, but overall, I think it's, it's a great thing, and, and I think it's an important check on the legislature. We'll come back to some of the specific things that are on the ballot this year, the 72-hour rule, which is, which is uh, num uh, initiative number 54, a little bit later in the program. But, but Peter Schrag, um, you're someone who's been vociferous in your views of why the ballot initiative uh, uh, project or, or process, rather, is, is not one that's healthy for good governance in California. Push back at Stephen Greenhut about why that's so. Well, I would say uh, consistent rather than vociferous, but, but uh, you, uh, you choose your words. Anyway, um, uh, I think a couple of things. Uh, Stephen Greenhouse says uh, that uh, the legislature also makes mistakes, which is true, but when the legislature makes a mistake, it can, back, can come back the next week and fix it, uh, or the next year, uh, which is not true with ballot measures, which are locked the way the California system works, uh, are locked in stone until there's another ballot measure to fix it. So that's one problem. The second problem is that uh, while, uh, and it's certainly true that the legislature uh, uh, messes up and uh, makes mistakes and does stupid things, um, uh, the more initiatives that pass, the more difficult it is for the legislature to act at all, uh, because every initiative, every ballot measure, uh, almost every ballot measure, is some kind of either restraint or compulsion on the legislature to do something. So its discretion is reduced. Um, uh, so the uh, uh, and and of course the uh, uh, the the, uh, uh, the 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 ballot measures uh, are themselves. Uh, strangely, uh, well, they're majoritarian. Uh, if you have a majority of one, um, uh, you pass, and the minority of minus one, of uh, 49.9%, um, uh, has no rights at all. Uh, in the in the regular legislative process, uh, there are hearings, 
there are uh, committee uh, processes, uh, there are uh, uh, people are heard, uh, there's consideration, uh, and more than that, more than that, uh, the legislature requires uh, vote, majority votes in two houses, the signature of a governor. Uh, so th- it's a much more deliber- deliberative process uh, than the initiative process. Um, uh, there have been attempts to fix some of that. Uh, they've never been very successful. Uh, but I could go on. I, I, uh, there's a whole uh, list, litany, I think, of, of things that uh, are drawbacks of the initiative process. Well, we'll work our way through uh, many of those uh, considerations over the course of our hour. But you mentioned the attempts to fix, and let's spend a moment on that, Kim Alexander, um, w- with the, what Peter was referring to, which was in 2014, there was an effort to try to work out a couple of reforms that would attempt to sort of slim down this this process. And, and describe what some of those efforts were. Part of the idea was that if if there there could be some compromise so that if you if people were putting forward a ballot initiative and they got their signatures together there could be a way to sort of say okay we're going to get this ballot together but um legislature why don't you take a crack at it one more time and if you can work something out then maybe we'll kind of pull our ballot initiative what happened with that why wasn't it more successful Well, I think that it was successful in some ways. It was the Ballot Initiative Transparency Act, or BETA for short, and it did allow, it does allow for somewhat more iterative process than we've had before. It does allow for a comments process when initiatives go into circulation. I know a lot of people used that uh, to comment on some internet voting proposals that were circulating. Um, And it also, there there was an instance of the uh, minimum wage initiative that had been in in circulation getting pulled because the legislature took it up and enacted it on their own. So I think that was an example of the process being more iterative than it has been. And another example was um, Prop 55. This is the proposition that would extend the tax increases that voters enacted uh, with Prop 30 in 2012, which are set to expire, and it would extend them another 12 years. And when uh, the governor revealed his budget in January, he was asked at the news conference about this proposal that had already been submitted, and he said he didn't like it, and it was missing some things, and the proponents pulled it and changed it and and amended it and put it back in. So um, we increased the the filing fee uh, considerably. I think it's $1,000 now. Um, and uh, it used to be 200. So we that got rid of some of the sort of vanity initiatives that had no chance of going anywhere. Um, and But I think what was really working against uh, the Ballot Initiative Transparency Act is this other law that kept initiatives off the primary ballot. So uh, we, have, we have them all stacked up now. Um, another set of reforms that came about through that law and another law set of laws that we worked on are better disclosure for voters, which goes to what Mark was talking about. You know, people are really confused about what's on the ballot. And we have found that if voters can follow the money and quickly identify who the top donors are, it's a really great shortcut to help them figure out how they want to align themselves, even if they don't understand every component of an initiative on the ballot. And so under these new laws, we have the Secretary of State maintaining a total list of how much is raised for and against every measure so people can see which ones are have a lot of money behind them. And then the FPPC is telling voters who the top 10 donors are. Um, So these agencies are doing the homework for the voters, giving voters very easy to use uh, data that we can help uh, voters make more informed decisions with. So Mark Pontel, sorry, uh, Kim Alexander is suggesting that some small steps were taken that that helped at least take one ballot initiative away. The minimum wage uh, was pulled, uh, signed, governor signed, making the $15 minimum wage uh, put into law. So one ballot, we would have had 18. Now we only have 17. Mm -hmm. So small steps. Also suggesting that if we have more transparency about money, that that will help at least give voters some guide for Mm -hmm. for how to vote. Are you optimistic that if we keep pushing in that direction, that that will help us at least give voters a way to at least if we're going to still vote so often on these things, that we'll have a better way of, of coming to terms with what's on the ballot and make more informed choices? Well, I think the legislature has been given some new tools. Um, whether they choose to use those tools um, more than they did this year, I think, is is a big question. We'll, we'll learn more from uh, this election about the new uh, rules on disclosure, which I think are also an incremental improvement, and whether that changes how people um, 
the difficulties people will face in um, in looking at at 17 ballot measures. Um, but overall, um, I mean, I can be pretty sure that the voters are going to look at this um, this ballot in November, add it to it, the the many uh, items that they're asked to to um, to, uh, to to weigh in on at the local level, and they're going to say this this is a lot of work. Is there something else that the legislative process can do before things appear on the ballot that um, are going to make more manageable my job, my job as as a voter uh, to make public policy. And um, the voters don't mind if the legislature is going to review, amend, change, even take things off the ballot. What, what, what they want is they want an ability to weigh in on decisions that the governor and legislature haven't. They consider that something that they would do not very often. I mean, the, really, the, the initiative process was really set up as something that would not come to the voters very often, but it would avoid um, the kind of situation we have today in Washington where people feel that nothing is getting done by the Congress and at least there's mm -hmm. an opportunity um, to weigh in on, on a big issue when nothing is getting done. So in, in your view, it's not so much that California voters want the opportunity to vote all the time. They just want the opportunity to vote some of the time. Exactly. They, they don't want um, all the time. They, when, the, when the legislative process isn't working, when, when corruption has gotten in the way of making good decisions, um, they want the ability to, uh, to make the change themselves. And, and, and they, they feel strongly that that is a right that they should have, um, but they don't want to be facing long ballots. So, so Peter Schrag, is it then incumbent on the legislature to become more effective if it is going to sort of um, take on again its real responsibility? You have made the argument, making the argument earlier, that one of the problems with the initiative process is that it sort of makes the legislature irrelevant, that, the, that in, in effect the population becomes the fourth fourth branch of, of government rather than the legislature doing its job. In a sense, though, then isn't it the responsibility of the legislature to become more effective so that people don't feel like they have to do that job? Uh, yes, yes and no. The trouble is that the initiative process itself tends to hamstring the legislature. Uh, so there's lots of things the legislature can't do anymore in California, um, and whether you're talking, I mean, uh, and, and also local government can't do anymore in California. Local government has no control over the property tax anymore, for example. It can lower it, but it can't raise it. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and there are a whole range of those things. And, and, uh, and yes, we've had some reforms that have been useful. Um, uh, and I think uh, one uh, that I think has been useful is that we've uh, uh, eliminated the two-thirds vote requirement for passing state budgets, uh, which I think has made uh, 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 life in, in Sacramento a little bit easier and a little bit smoother. Um, uh, but, 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 but the process itself still uh, blocks the legislature from doing any number of things that it historically it was able to do and that legislatures in other states that don't have the initiative process can do. Stephen Greenhut, on, on, on that question, that this has become so, the legislature has been so constrained in terms of, of what it can do, that so many of these things have been taken away by the ballot initiative, whether that's rules and, and that on property taxes or any number of other things, and that once it's been, uh, once a public, once a law has been made by way of ballot initiative, it can only be undone by way of ballot initiative. So therefore, the purview that the legislature has is that much smaller. Well, sure. And that's probably a good thing. I mean, I, I don't see the legislature being terribly constrained from doing a lot of things. Uh, but let, let's look at the overall you know, picture of democracy in California. I mean, we have the worst representation in the, in the state, right? In, in New Hampshire, you have one is state house member. This is the most. They have the best representation for like 3,200 people. Here it's one for every 483,000 people. We have redistricting, which is you know where the, the politicians basically select their voters. So it's not so easy to throw the bums out. So um, I like the idea that as as voters we can go to the ballot box and constrain that legislature. That that's a good thing. And the idea that the legislature is some sort of 
well-oiled machine that is uh, operating in the public interest is, you know, it's, it's kind of nonsense. I mean, when Kim had mentioned earlier that the the ballot, uh, you know, the no, everything's on the November ballot, and that was done largely because uh, unions uh, did not want, uh, you know, pension reform on, on the June ballot. Um, and we look at a couple things, and, and I know we'll talk about the specifics later, but mar- marijuana legalization is on the ballot uh, this year. Uh, it, it was in 1996 that voters uh, passed medical marijuana reform, and it's taken, it's been 20 years before the legislature finally got around, and they did it this year, to pass a bunch of regulations so it was clear how locals could operate, and they only did that because there's a recreational marijuana uh, measure on the ballot. So, uh, you know, I, I think the, here's a good case where the voters are leading the legislature in, in what I think is a good direction. Fair enough. Fair point. Kim Alexander, pick up on that. Why is it so hard for the legislature to take up topics that are of seeming such high interest, such as, as recreational marijuana? Why wasn't that something that the legislature itself didn't deal with? That's a great question. And, you know, I I do see the initiative process as a failsafe for a corrupt legislative process. I mean, it is more deliberative than the initiative process. But as you step back and look at what's happening here in Sacramento, we still have a very money driven process. The money comes from special interests. Those special interests are keep lawmakers busy tackling lots of little problems and avoiding the big issues because those special interests want to maintain the status quo. So that's why you see some of these issues on the ballot. Um, The drug pricing initiative is a great example of that. Um, The tobacco tax initiative, these are the kinds of things that special interests keep out of the legislative agenda altogether. And then you also have the dynamic of lawmakers, you know, not wanting to be on the record taking votes on hard issues mm-hmm. that may come back to harm them later. So they don't want to take a vote on marijuana legalization. They don't want to take a vote on the issue of pornography related practices. They don't they don't want to have votes on gun control very often. So or the death penalty. I mean, those are issues that can really harm you in your political career down the line. So I think that, you know, they're very careful and they stay within the lines. And, and you, that's why I think people get frustrated and they want to work around the legislature and bring their ideas directly to the voters. And that's why we see initiatives on these kinds of topics. Uh, Kim, go ahead. Uh, uh, I, I agree with, with, with Kim, my friend Kim Alexander. But if you're talking about money-driven processes, there's nothing more money-driven than the initiative process. Uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you don't get on the ballot to begin with. Uh, and if you look at the just the reports today uh, on what's being spent on the, this this year's crop, um, it, 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 the, the money is enormous. Um, so and 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 there's of course a general sense among uh, interest groups that they can spend their money better on the initiative uh, than they can on politicians uh, because among other things the initiative is more reliable. They used to they used to be a remark, which is now I suppose uh, sexist uh, that. The initiatives don't have wives. Uh, Peter, uh, let me let me hold you there, if I, I might. Interesting point. We'll pick up on that when we return. Peter Schrag joining us along with Kim Alexander, Stephen Greenhut, and Mark Baldessari as we look at the initiative process and how well it works or how well it doesn't work here in California. We'll take your calls when we return. 866-733-6786. This is Forum on KQED. I'm Dave Iverson. Welcome back to Forum. I'm Dave Iverson in this week for Michael Krasny. Our topic this hour, the ballot initiative process, something that has been a large part of how California works since 1905 when it was one of the many progressive era reforms ushered in by Governor Hiram Johnson. In that time, it's been such a key part of how California functions since then. We're talking about how well it functions now or doesn't function now and the way in which it will be a big part of this year's election in 2016. Some 17 different ballot initiatives are with us this year, ranging everything from pornography to drug prescription uh, prices, death penalty, to uh, ammunition, to uh, medical or not medical, recreational marijuana, uh, 
questions about taxes, uh, tobacco taxes, income taxes, uh, cost of education, all kinds of things that are on the ballot this year. Why is that? How well does it work? Should these be decisions made by the legislature rather than people? We want to get your thoughts as well. You can join us at 866-733-6786. Email us at forum at kqed.org. You can also post your thoughts on our website. That's kqed.org slash forum. Before, right before the break, uh, Peter, I want to, Peter Schrag, um, author and, and, and columnist, I want to, you're, you're making a, a key point. I want to just let you finish your thought about um, the, the, the role of money in all of this. We were talking about how money influences the legislature, but you were, you were saying that there's a lot of money involved in, in, the, in the initiative process as well. Just finish that thought, if you would, please. There's, a, there's an old story uh, about a lobbyist and uh, a, log, a lawyer in Sacramento, uh, and a, an interest group came to him and, and said, uh, "Can we uh, wanted something to put on the ballot. And he said, well, first let me ask you the million-dollar question. And they said, what's that? And he said, have you got a million dollars? Hmm. And, and, and that, of course, was many years ago. Now probably the question is, have you got $30 million? But whatever, uh, it, it's clear that in order just to get the signatures, just to qualify, uh, you need a fair amount of money because um, it, it costs money. I mean, depends on the circumstances and what the competing initiatives are and so on. But but. You don't get on the ballot uh, without a significant amount of money. Uh, so the old idea that this was a citizen's process where people went door to door to their neighbors and got signatures, uh, that almost never happens anymore. It's too com- There are too many signatures required. The time is too tight. Um, uh, it, it just doesn't happen. So it is a money process, and, you, and, and obviously the competition for money uh, who can spend the most in the campaign is also a very crucial issue. And Kim Alexander, this takes us back to the point that you made earlier, that one of the reforms, one of the things that you think is central to keeping this process working as well as it can in the future is as much transparency about that money as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And Peter is right. I mean, you can't win an initiative uh, without money, but you also can't win with only money. And I've seen plenty of examples of people trying to do yeah. that. Um Prop 14 is a great example. This was the uh, PG&E so-called right to vote uh, initiative that was trying to limit uh, the access to voters' ability to be able to convert to public utilities from privately held uh, services. And they spent almost $50 million trying to get voters to pass that. And the opponents spent less than $100,000 and the voters defeated it because I think that, you know, voters and Mark might have an opinion about this, too. But I, my view is that voters take the position of I'm going to vote no unless you convince me otherwise. Mm. They take this role very seriously. And interestingly enough, what I've noticed over the years is when the legislature puts a measure on the ballot, it passes about two out of three times legislative measures pass because it's been deliberated and the voters see there's a vote in the voter guide and they know that it's gone through an amendment process through the legislative process. Conversely, initiatives only pass about one out of every three times. So I think in some ways the initiative process itself is self-regulating. And I look at people who put initiatives out and think that, you know, they can get their pet ID idea out there. And I know that unless they've got a big campaign, grassroots campaign, and other kinds of support behind them, they're not going to succeed. It's an interesting thought that, that in some ways the legislature could use the, the voters as a sort of extra level of, of validation, uh, Mark Baldessari. Um, give us a couple of, let me get a couple of thoughts from you, and then I want to go to our calls and, and emails because I'm getting lots of interesting thoughts in. But on Kim's point that in the main, voters' general position on a default position on, on, on ballot initiative is no. They, we tend to think of this as this, this way that lots of laws get passed. But in, in general, actually, most ballot initiatives don't pass, right? That's right. Um, since, since 2000, um, two-thirds of the initiatives that have gone to the ballot have not passed. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that voters approach initiatives with the idea that this is a process that is dominated by special interests. In our polls, overwhelming proportions of Californians say the initiative process, um, there's too much influence of special interests. So they 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 began they begin with the idea that um, that um, uh, they're skeptical about who's put uh, who's put something on the ballot, and it has to be proven to them that there's a reason to vote yes. Which is why um, the special interests, um, if they if they pile money on the no side, um, chances are um, that they'll get voters to to say no. 
and to our calls. Let's go first to uh, Casey in Pleasant Hill. Casey, go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking it. Um, th- and thanks for the program. This is a huge issue, and, and I appreciate the perspective of the earlier uh, of guests who said that this was a lot of work. And every year, um, the, the workload involved in being an informed voter on the initiative process is very challenging. But um, to the point just discussed, the, I, tend, I tend not to be too cynical. I'm an optimist, but I, uh, I, I do have kind of a jaded view of what the initiative process has become. I agree that um, the process appears to have been corrupted by special interest itself. I appreciate the uh, earlier comment that there are mechanisms in place where we can see who's spending what, but following that and even just triangulating on arguments for and against to try to get at the truth is really tough. Casey, thanks. Advice, Kim Alexander? Yeah, he makes a great point. And actually, this is one of the reasons why I started the California Voter Foundation was because I was feeling overwhelmed myself with how challenging it is to be an informed voter in California. And at the same time, I feel really lucky to be a Californian because we do have this right to direct democracy, which voters in other states don't enjoy and voters in other countries don't enjoy. And I also uh, know that being California, our initiative process can become a bellwether in the issues that we uh, uh, enact through our process or defeat through our process. So that's a lot of power that California voters have. And I want to make sure they can exercise it responsibly. And fortunately, over the last 20 years, we've seen the internet develop into this amazing tool. And we've seen people being able to access the internet through their smartphones. You don't have to have a computer now to be able to get online. And my organization, California Voter Foundation, at calvoter.org, publishes all kinds of resources online for voters. We're working to get lookup tools for voters to make it easy to check your status, see what's on your ballot. Um, so there's always room for improvement. It is a big job. We, we encourage voters to organize election house parties. That's a great way to get together with your friends. and Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> yeah, prepare to vote together. And so there are ways that you can make it fun. You can learn, sing along on the proposition song. Hopefully that will be a good uh, learning tool for voters. But I agree, it's a lot of work. And and we we need to make sure that people can vote with confidence. And that's what I think is most important, not just that people vote, but when they vote, they feel like Mark was saying, that they know what they're voting on. And that's what I want to make sure that we minimize. And that's hard to do because these are complicated issues. I saw a fun picture uh, posted that maybe we could put up on our, our website uh, from, I think, the San Diego Union uh, newspaper of a voter, the this year's voter guide, which uh, looks like a, a, you know the New York City phone book of old, it's uh, it's going to be an impressive uh, impressive task uh, this year. Let's go on to uh, Carrie next in San Jose. Carrie, go ahead, please. Hi, Dave. Thanks. I have a comment and a question. Uh, first, I wanted to say, as much as I get frustrated with um, initiatives, especially ballot box uh, budgeting and unfunded carve outs, um, I think they're very important, especially when we face dysfunctional government and hyper partisanship. And the money in politics issue plays hugely into that, I think. And um, I'm glad that there's a voter instruction uh, that will be uh, placed on the ballot to instruct our elected officials at all levels to do everything possible to get money out of politics. And I wish that voters would pay attention because voters across the political spectrum uh, from what I've seen, um, are concerned about the money and politics issue, but they're not paying attention to who they vote for and how they vote on the money and politics issue. Those who, at the federal level, refuse to uh, get money out of politics by seating a Supreme Court justice or by voting for some of the various legislative uh, things that are put before them aren't sincere about getting money out, and I think those voters should pay attention to that. But it is really hard. But I wanted to find out if any of your panelists know uh, what percentage, because I think it's very low, of the state budget the legislature still has control over after all of the uh, unfunded carve-outs that have been put before uh, the voters over the years. Carrie, thanks. Uh, first, a quick reference to what you referenced in terms of the money in politics. That's Proposition 59, which is only an advisory uh, proposition urging the legislature to uh, urge Congress to do something to overturn the Citizens United uh, vote. Uh, but uh, so that's that's the reference to that's an advisory proposition or, or ballot initiative only. Anyone know the answer to Carrie's question about uh, 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 how much jurisdiction the legislature still has over over the budget? 
did, given how much is pieced off by very various ballot initiatives, sending money to schools and, and whatnot. Uh, Kim or Mark, have any sense of that? Well, there's still a lot of money. I don't know the exact percent, but you know, the legislature still has um, you know a, a lot of control over um, the budget and billions of dollars. Um, I, I, I think it's Peter a, Shrek. I think it's a, a tough question because it's a question of what you count. Mm -hmm. If you're counting, for example, uh, the uh, uh, three strikes initiative, uh, essentially uh, 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 requiring much longer uh, prison sentences and the costs for that, is that is that something that is now allocated by the voters? I think yes. Uh, even though uh, the voters didn't know when they voted on it that it was going to cost a ton of money. Um, so there are all of those things. They, they may even now begin to realize it and are now backing away from some of those tough on crime measures. But, but it certainly was the case. It's certainly true with school funding. Uh, uh, it's true with uh, limitations on taxes, um, which, uh, has, again, affect uh, the budget. Um, but it's hard. I think it's hard to be very specific because it's a question of what you count. Yeah, interesting, interesting point. <laughs> Emails coming in. Yes, go ahead, Stephen. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, one point I, I've heard on the last two callers were talking about, you know, how tough it is to do the research. And I know when I was on the editorial board at the Orange County Register back in the day, we did not endorse candidates, but we endorsed initiatives. And the thinking was that at least you know what you're getting with an initiative. And I think that's an important point. Mm. You can realistically research an initiative and what it means. How do you really research a candidate, right? And, and I, think that's a, I think that's one reason uh, people tend to like it. Fair enough. That must be a lot of what, what a lot of Republican voters are asking now, right? Here's some comments coming in from our, our listeners I want to read. Alex writes, the initiative process has its faults, but it's more important than ever because of current extremes in partisan politics. The voters can vote for something directly without worrying who gets credit for it. But in our legislature, parties are constantly jockeying for defeat for even anything they agree with, simply to prevent the opposing party for taking credit for it. Jeff writes, the initiative process is faux democracy. It looks like democracy because we all get to vote. But real democracy includes a time when the proposal can be amended. Initiatives do not allow for this. And Keith writes, I think the ballot measure provides more objective clarity than polls or studies or rhetoric as, it, as to how people feel or what they want. It provides a check against the media and politicians who can influence outcomes. And Steve tweets in, as we are very near to a one-party state government now, how would getting rid of the one major remaining check help things? That's something I know you agree with, Stephen, right? That, it, that in, a, in a state like California, where conservatives um, don't have much influence, and in, in certainly in the legislature, and with uh, the, 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 our, our system now where you have uh, the top two uh, uh, runoff, where you sometimes have two Democrats uh, running, as they are now for the United States Senate, um, that, that conservatives with, with uh, the, the ballot initiative sometimes have an opportunity to push back in a way that they don't always have in the legislature. Well, indeed. And, and, you know, we were talking about money before. And, yeah, it's true. Uh, what Peter says is this takes a heck of a lot of money to run a ballot. But I've noticed certainly on initiatives at the local level that uh, I remember one uh, woman who helped stop a, a tax, a parcel tax in Irvine, and she spent $100. But you don't have to match uh, dollar for dollar, but you still have You at least have a shot in the initiative process. And it's, and it's not just liberals. I mean, not just conservatives. I'm a libertarian, so I would love to see some of these policing reforms and some of these. Uh, I've all, I've been a opponent of a lot of this uh, law and order, tough on crime nonsense, and an advocate for things like legalization of marijuana and things like that. And those things don't go anywhere. Um, and and that's because, especially on the policing issues, the control of, of the police unions um, among Democrats and Republicans, as civil asset forfeiture. I'd love to see a ballot initiative on that because it's, it seems almost hopeless that we, we can get a serious reform through the, the legislature. So it's not just conservatives. I mean, I'm conservative on a lot of issues, but uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of issues. I think that that liberals should be frustrated yeah. uh, that aren't going anywhere in the in the legislature. So I think it's great to have 
uh, this. And of course, it costs a lot of money, and and all the points, like Mark pointed out, most of them still fail. It, it's a, I think it's a great uh, fail safe. Mark, well, sorry, uh, during our break earlier, you were you were sort of making the point that some of you were kind of connecting some dots here. I wondered if you'd you'd reiterate that that maybe one of the reasons why the legislature doesn't contend with some of these tough issues has to do with what Stephen was just suggesting, the role of money and, and some whether that's unions or other moneyed interests make the legislature want to stay away from taking tough votes. I think that it's going to be um, uh, challenging for a lot of legislators to, to take up the initiative measures that they could um, amend and uh, review and perhaps even prevent from being on the ballot because um, they've so they've you know solved the legal issues because um, you know they're, they're coming up against the same moneyed interests um, uh, in the initiative process as um, as we do in the legislature when you're taking on the yes or the no side of initiative campaigns California could learn a lot from other states where the initiative process is used um, with great frequency and I'm thinking uh, for example, the state of Oregon, which has uh, made it easier for voters by um, by sending everybody a mail ballot, um, by having a citizens initiative review commission that will take up and um, certain initiatives and have public hearings, and recognizes that you know maybe the media doesn't do its full job because, in fact, you know the reality is that a lot of people are learning about initiatives yes and no from those television uh, commercials that they're seeing um, at, at 11 o'clock at night. So, um, you know, California has um, has some things to learn from some other states that uh, are also struggling with this issue of how do you get the voters to be able to um, to do the hard work that the legislature isn't doing. Mark Baldessari, CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California, joining us along with Peter Schrag, columnist and author, Stephen Greenhut, also the Western Region Director of the R Street Institute, and Kim Alexander, President and Founder of the California Voter Foundation. We'd like you to join us as well. You can do so at 866-733-6786. Email us at forum at kqed.org. Back to our calls. Bob in San Francisco joins us next. Bob, go ahead. Oh, why not have a new class of initiative that simply proposes a law and requires the legislature to make a person-by-person -person recorded vote on that law? See, I'm not quite sure I, I, I follow the notion. Say it one more time, please, Bob. It's an, in, it's an initiative that proposes a law, but instead of saying yes and no on it, requires the legislature uh, to vote on that law and have a recorded vote person-by-person. So to take a topic like, let's say, the legalization of marijuana, so, so the initiative would be not to pass whether or not marijuana is legal, but to require the legislature to vote on that issue? No, to, to, uh, to say, for instance, here's, an, here's, here's a law. You um, med legalize medical marijuana. Now, legislature, vote on that. Right. And we will record on a person-by-person -person basis Got it. what you voted. Okay. Got it, Bob. Thank you. Kim Alexander, your thoughts? Uh, that's a really clever idea. I wrote down reverse initiative. Um, I think it's it's interesting, you know, and it's kind of close to what Prop 59 is doing, which another caller uh, mentioned. This is the advisory vote. And that, that proposition actually had qualified for a previous ballot and was challenged in court because the opponents claimed that there was nothing in the initiative process that allowed for this kind of legislative question or advisory vote um, because there's nothing binding in Prop 59. It's a message the voters are sending to the legislature. And the California Supreme Court said, you know what, this is lawful and they allowed it to go forward and the legislature approved it going back on the ballot. And that's why we have Prop 59. And it may open the doors to possibly more measures, but also more advisory measures that are not um, enacting law per se, but instead directing the legislature to take some action or could do what Bob suggested, uh, take a vote on a specific topic. I'm, I'm just curious if we have sort of unanimity on this. Stephen and, and Peter and, and Mark, do you all like this idea? I don't know. It's, it sounds interesting. It sounds like something I'd like to. I'd like to study at least as much as I study any given initiative. <laughs> Peter, well, I, uh, you know, we talked a lot uh, in, in the last hour about uh, how hard a job the voters have uh, in doing all these things, and I'm not sure that um, that that voting should be a hard job. 
I think voting should be an easy job um, and should be an attractive job. It should not be a struggle um, uh, sitting through uh, 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 sometimes hundreds or thousands of pages uh, of uh, ballot uh, language. Um, uh, I think voting should be easy, and I think that uh, I think uh, uh, all uh, all ballot measures make voting harder. And I and I I want to uh, echo that. And um, sp- speaking for the Californians who face long ballots and lots of decisions, um, I think we we need to find more ways for the legislature to do its job. And and to your po- earlier point, also Mark Bolt, sorry, there are there are states. I think Wisconsin, Minnesota. There are a number of states that mm-hmm. actually use this in a sort of more judicious, kind of limited way, not mm-hmm. in quite the on steroids way that California does. Yeah, there's there's really no one. Um, I mean, we are just off the charts in terms of how much money is spent combined with how many um, ballot measures there are. But the states that do have a lot of ballot measures, I, I again, I think. We have something to learn from them because they they have found ways um, to adjust to the fact that and make it easier for voters. Um, you know, the reality is today a voter is not going to go into a polling booth and answer, you know, and, and read 17 state propositions and make the decisions there. It's something that will take will, will happen over the course of, of days. So, you know, um, that's why Oregon's gone to the mail, the mail ballot. Everyone except apparently Aaron, who tweets in, I love the initiative process. I wish I could vote on more issues. All right, Aaron. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for tweeting that in. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, some other comments coming in. Uh, uh, this is uh, some, someone who writes in, uh, the legislature should do their job and not put initiatives on the ballots unless an initiative is super crystal clear and simple with a compelling argument. I will always vote no. Ben, on the other hand, writes, isn't this what democracy is all about? Maybe if we had a day off on Election Day, we could spend more time learning all the issues. This kind of participation limits the power of lobbyists. Let's go to Ruth, Ruth Ann, rather, in El Cerrito. Ruth Ann, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi there. I have a very unpopular view. Um, okay. To confirm what the fellow that's one of your guests said before me that is just a boatload of work for these citizens to do. I understand why people are so in favor of it because of how frustrated they are with how the legislature is governing. But my sense is that it is not our job as voters to do that work. The way the system is set up is that we elect legislatures to set up committees and to do the appropriate research and to vet the bills and all of that. And so I never vote on ballot initiatives because I think that's not my job. My job is to vote for candidates who are going to address that and set up the appropriate vetting measures. And I have had friends who I've said that to who have just said, you know, I don't vote in the regular elections. The only elections I vote on are the ballot measures. So Mm -hmm. I know people adore it because it's direct democracy. I just don't think it's the government that we have set up in California to do the work. Yeah. Thank you, Ruthann. Um, Stephen, ar- argue with Ruthann, if you would, please. Oh, I, I think it's great. I mean, I was going to, the point I was going to make is the ballot initiative, the ballot pamphlet seems to be pretty clear. There's ton, There are tons of ways to get research on it. At least you know what you're getting on the initiative. You don't know what you're getting on a, on a politician. And then with the poli- so many issues just have no chance. I see it up at the legislature. There is no chance that a lot of exceedingly important issues will see the light of day. At the very least, the initiative provides pressure for the legislature to take on some issues that they wouldn't do, like the 72-hour rule that's on the, on the ballot. Uh, that's gone nowhere for years. And now all of a sudden, after it qualifies for the ballot, all of a sudden the legislature was in a hurry to come up with a, uh, a softened version of the bill that never would have happened to put on as an alternative, um, and uh, which didn't, didn't go forward, but they tried. And without the initiative process, they just would have uh, just ignored it, just like they've ignored uh, medical marijuana, just like they've ignored issue after issue, pension reform. Uh, these are important issues, and so we have a chance to pressure the legislature to do its job. Otherwise, especially with the poor representation, the way the districts are, are, are laid out, so you really can't throw the bums out. We're, ju- we're just stuck. It's, it's, a, it's a good way, and I think Californians, we're smart. We can figure it out. It's not a big deal. We figure out what kind of stuff to buy on Amazon. We can figure out what to vote for. 
Steve, 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 can I just, uh, uh, just one sec, uh, Kim. I just want to. Uh, yeah. Stephen uh, was re- referencing uh, Prop uh, Fifty Four, just so that people know what the reference is. Is that's the uh, uh, proposition which would uh, uh, prohibit the legislature from passing any bill until it's been print and published on the internet for seventy-two hours prior to the vote. We're, we're uh, short on time, um, Kim. I just want to ask you one thing, if you might, and you can fold this into your your response. But everyone always brings up this election uh, holiday idea. Anytime we do one of these sorts of shows, you think that could ever happen here in California? I like the idea, but we did do a poll question on this among infrequent voters to see if it would make them more likely to vote. And it was kind of a wash. You know, uh, we we asked, you know, if we made elections on the weekend, some people said they'd be more likely to vote. Some said they'd be less likely to vote, but it'd be worth exploring. And I just want to also pick up on what Ruth Ann said about not voting on initiatives. Voters don't have to vote on everything on the ballot. And I don't think we do a good <laughs> enough job educating voters about the fact that voting isn't a test and it's perfectly fine to just vote on the measures that you feel comfortable voting on. And I have seen some polling data that shows that many voters mistakenly think they do have to vote on every contest on the ballot in order for their votes to count. And that's not accurate. So I think we need to make that clear to voters. I've often suggested adding skip this contest to the to the yes-no choices <laughs> so that it's obvious to voters that they don't have to have an answer for every question. Maybe you can add that as a last line in your song. It is one of the last lines of my song, actually, Dave. <laughs> Kim Alexander, president and founder of the California, California Voter Foundation. Thanks for being part of our program. Thanks, too, to Peter Schrag, a journal, a journalist and author, Stephen Greenhut of the Western Region, director Mark Baldessari, CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California. Thanks all for your participation in our program. Forum is produced by Judy Campbell, Irene Noguchi, and Tina Larberg. Our engineer is Danny Bringer. Our engagement producers are Amanda Stupai and Jeremy Siegel, and we get online support from Amanda Font. Our interns are Brandon Yu and Maxine Schaefer-Wolf. Our senior editor is Dan Saul, and our executive producer is Joanne Wallace. I'm Dave Iverson in this week for Michael Krasny, and this is Forum on KQED. Funds for the production of Forum are provided by the members of KQED Public Radio, the Germanicos Foundation and the Generosity Foundation, and by a generous gift from Jan Schrem and Maria Minetti Schrem, founders of Clopagas Winery, who believe that all people deserve access to.